Every jump, every spin, and every twist exhibit a complexity of demanding physical forces. Today, we'll elucidate some of the most fundamental yet intriguing physics laws and principles that govern the performances of athletes. We also interviewed our physics teachers to share their invaluable knowledge with us. Mastery of figure skating relies on a myriad of factors. To begin, let's discuss the conservation of angular momentum. The initial angular momentum is equal to the final angular momentum. Angular momentum is represented by a capital L and is the product of the moment of inertia and angular velocity. The moment of inertia is the tendency for an object to rotate or stop rotating. So the bigger moment of inertia you have, the harder it is to start something or to stop it from spinning its rotation. This is a reference to Newton's first law of motion. Notice how the skater alters where her mass is located. As her limbs come in, her moment of inertia gets smaller and smaller, while her angular velocity gets bigger and bigger. What it comes down to, physics-wise, is the conservation of angular momentum. If your angular momentum is a set amount, and you manipulate your moment of inertia by adjusting where your mass is distributed, your angular velocity increases to compensate for that change. Likewise, if you extend your arms back out, you'll increase your moment of inertia and you will slow down. Um, what are the characteristics of ice that make it ideal for skaters to skate on? Well, one thing we know is that the uh, friction, right? So friction prevents motion or slipping from taking place. So for ice, it has a very low coefficient of friction. So that's why it's ideal for skating, because once you have that initial motion, you would tend to continue your motion based on Newton's first law. Okay. Ice has a remarkably low coefficient of friction, for example, like 0 .0, 0 0.05 for static friction, and 0 0.04 to 0 0.02 for kinetic friction. How does the increase of ice temperature affect the slipperiness of the ice? Okay, so... Hockey rinks and ice rinks are usually in the 20 degree range, somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees. Um, the temperature of the ice, you actually want it to be a little bit warmer for figure skating than like you would for hockey. Because with like figure skating, you're jumping in the air. Like if you have really, really hard frozen ice, that actually can lead to like more injuries. So for hockey, they tend to keep it colder than 24 degrees, but for figure skating, it's usually like 25 to 30 degrees. So that you get a little bit softer ice when you land. They can then use those, the blades are a little duller for figure skating too, so you can like carve into the ice. Um, and so warmer ice, yes, there's gonna be a teensy bit more friction, but like it also is there for like safety things. Because you don't need to go as fast with figure skating as you might with like a hockey play, and you don't have to worry about like the puck sliding for figure skating. So that little bit softer ice isn't a big deal. Um, Indoors, it's usually okay. Like the air temperature is not gonna be warm enough to like melt the ice where it like becomes dangerous to skate off. Um, but as it gets softer, you just lose speed, which makes it harder to do certain elements. Um, and how would you define angular momentum? Angular momentum can be described using the equation, right? So we know for any angular motion, we have that linear component. So for momentum, we have your initial mass and also this uh, velocity that it's going at. For angular motion, you will convert them to their angular counterparts. So for, instead of using mass, you will have the moment of inertia, and then you will also have um, the velocity, which is converted to angular velocity. So uh, multiplying, I find the product of those two, and you get the angular momentum. So here my awesome student Turing is going to demonstrate how angular momentum works. So she's currently holding a dumbbell mm -hmm. and we can figure out the moment of inertia or we can manipulate the moment of inertia by changing how far those additional mass is away from the center of rotation, which is where her body is. If I want to increase my uh, moment of inertia, then my angular velocity is going to be lower. 
Uh, in accordance to the conservation of angular momentum, if terrain is to pull her arm in during the rotation and therefore decrease the moment of inertia, that her angular velocity is going to increase. So we're gonna show that real quick. So Terry, can you hold on to both yeah, with the rope hands and then just extend your arm out. So I'm gonna spin Terry uh, real quick and then she will spin at a certain angular velocity. And after she starts rotating, she will pull her oh arm God. in and increase oh <laughs> her spin. Sorry. Good okay. try, Karen. <laughs> Um, if you're scared, like don't lock your knees and then just bend it slightly. Yeah. And like the lower you bend, like you lower your center of mass and you'll fall off as you <laughs> Alright, so extend your arm out again. Alright, pull your arm in. Oh my god. Yeah, there we go. That's more fun. How is okay. angular momentum conserved during a figure skating jump? Okay. So like once the skater leaves the ice, there's no external force causing them to rotate differently. So their angular momentum is going to be constant. By changing their body position in the air, they're changing their moment of inertia, which changes their angular velocity. So like by bringing their arms in really close, they spin really fast, arms out, slow down. Um, and so since there's no force changing the total amount of momentum they have, once they generate it by jumping off the ice, really they're in control of how fast they go by how they place their body. How does training condition skaters to avoid getting dizzy? So again, from a dance perspective, um, your inner ear tells you like which way's up and so do your eyes. So that's part of what we call your vestibular balance system. And so part of rotating, when you spin a lot, you have to basically tell your body like, oh no, I'm not spinning. And you like train your brain to kind of ignore the signals that are telling you like, I'm gonna fall over. I should counterbalance by doing this because that would actually throw you off balance. Um, and so uh, a lot of it is just practice, practice, practice. They start small with like one or two turns and then they slowly work their way up to what's required of like, I think it's like six to 10 spins once you get into like competition. Um, so part of it's that. Um, they've done some studies with like rapid eye movement too um, that helps people who have like vertigo. Like basically you feel like the world is spinning, but like if your eyes like basically move against the spin, it can sort of trick your body into thinking you're not spinning. Um, and also like once we're rotating our body, if we like fix our eyes on a point, like our body can't sense that we're rotating anymore. Um, it just can t detect like the change in rotation. So like while you're taking off or landing, um, and then some studies have shown like, we don't know if like figure skaters do it on purpose or not, but a lot of times they like will choreograph spins out of spins or out of a jump. They won't just like spin and then totally stop. Like they'll either like move their head or move their arm to kind of bring some of that rotation with them out of the jump. So it's not like start, stop, start. And that helps with being dizzy as well. Thank you. Does body shape or distribution of mass affect the overall balance of a jump? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so your center of mass is what you're trying to get up off the ice. So it's like a delicate balance because if you want to jump higher, you need more muscle mass. But more muscle mass means that you have more mass, which slows down your rotation because you have more moment of inertia. So skaters have to like balance this, this tough choice of like, do I need stronger muscles to get higher up into the air versus like, how can I get that into so tight a position I can spin as fast as possible? Cause I mean, right now everyone's trying to hit like quad jumps and even theoretically quints, like that's the goal, right? Um, they've done studies that show like a quint would be really difficult to hit um, without having a bigger shift in mass. So like they've had like skaters try like holding weights and they've been able to like generate enough change and angular momentum to get around five times. So it's theoretically possible. The question is finding that balance uh, between the two because they found that the air time between like a triple jump and a quad jump, they're spending the same amount of hang time in the air as they go up and come down in like their parabola. But it's the moment of inertia that dictates do they make it around enough times to actually land the jump. So the center of mass is the average position of where your masses are located, right? So if you're um, 
I wouldn't say, like, of course, like your body type or where your mass are distributed throughout your body can affect your center of mass. For example, if you're taller, then your center of mass is probably going to be a lot higher. If you have a stronger upper body or have more muscle as a result, then you're also going to have a higher um, center of mass. And vice versa, like if your most of your weight is distributed in the lower half, if you have like really strong legs and really weak arms, right, then you can drop that uh, lower. Figure skating has evolved um, due to you know the different techniques and different demands, right. So for a figure skater, a lot of them need to have very high rotational uh, velocity. So um, depending on your gender and your body composition, you can have different advantages and disadvantages. For example, um, females tend to be on the lighter side in terms of mass. So what, you, that, what that means is you can use that to your advantage, and um, since you're lighter, you can jump higher. And for men, because they have more muscle, so that means they're more powerful, so when they take off and do the jump, then they can have a more powerful spin based on like their um, muscle power. Um, a lot of questionable um, coaching practice is that they want to maximize you know, the advantage that comes with their body composition. So for example, um, you know, the most recent Russian cheating scandal is that you will use medication so that you can increase like your heart rate and cause better performance, or you will starve the athletes and therefore keep their mass really low and keep their um, high, you know, high jumps. So from a physics perspective, what strategies can figure skaters implement to enhance their aerodynamics? So they've actually done some research studies. Um, I believe there's a professor at the University of Delaware who helps the US figure skating team, but they take video analysis of the skaters and they show them, okay, well, here's where your arms are in your rotation, here's where your feet are. Like if you cross your feet, bring your arms in, um, you can quickly tighten up and spin quicker. Some skaters choose to put their arms all the way up. And like, while that is more difficult to get your arms there, um, by stretching your body really long, sometimes that can actually make your core more stable and help them spin like with a straighter axis of rotation. So they're not like bent over at all because uh, that would make it harder to rotate. And so they'll analyze their jump and then they have computer models that'll show you like, oh, like if you move your body like this many degrees more this way, like you could go this much faster. And little tiny changes in like body position can like result in big changes in angular momentum. So like a change of like one to four degrees of like just how tight your arms are to your body could result in the difference between landing a quad and not landing. Since figure skating jumps are in a parabol par parabolic curve, is conservation of energy applicable? Of course, conservation is always applicable. Um, so when you are jumping, what you're doing is you're converting different types of energy from one form to another. So when you take off, you have that translational kinetic energy. And obviously, as you're traveling in the air, you still have that. But part of them, uh, for example, the vertical component is going to convert to the maximum height that you can reach, which is the gravitational potential energy. But the whole time, you're still keeping your rotational kinetic energy because you are spinning. Right? So figure skating jumps are in a parabolic curve. Does the initial kinetic energy affect the path of the curve? So. Yes and no. Um, it'll affect the horizontal distance they travel across the ice during the jump. So because they're going into the jump with linear velocity, like that'll make them go further like across. Um, but the time in the air is all dictated by the like Newton's third law pair when they jump off the ice. Like they push down on the ice, the ice pushes up on them. That's going to give them some upward velocity. That'll go to zero and then come back down in the parabola. So basically, the faster they go into it this way, the further across the ice they'll go. But that won't necessarily guarantee them success if they don't have enough time in the air to make it around enough times. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was oh, very informative. You. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I know, it's probably like more information than you needed, but that's... No, it's very thorough.